His election in 1800 marked a turning point. Ruled by the Federalist Party of George Washington and John Adams, and those years of Jefferson set the tone for decades to follow. In his first inaugural address in 1801, Jefferson gave us a splendid, timeless summation of what government should do. It did not describe programs of redistribution. In Jefferson's words, here's what sound government does, quote, a wise and frugal or thrifty government which shall restrain men from injuring one another shall leave them otherwise free to regulate their own pursuits of industry and improvement and shall not take from the mouth of labor the bread it has earned. This, he said, is the sum of good government. A similar view was held by James Madison, a key figure in the construction of our Constitution, a primary defender of it in the Federalist Papers, and America's fourth president. He vetoed bills for so-called internal improvements. And at that time, internal improvements were things like roads. Madison vetoed them time and again. And he said uh, often that this was not a function of the federal government, though it may be a function of local government. It would be inconceivable to James Madison, the primary architect of our Constitution, to use the power of government to take from some and give to others. Inconceivable. To Madison and Jefferson, there was no constitutional case to be made for uh, federal government assistance to individuals in poverty. In a speech in the U.S. House of Representatives, before he became president, Madison declared, quote, the government of the United States is a definite government confined to specified objects. It is not like state governments whose powers are more general. Charity, he said, is no part of the legislative duty of the government in Washington. Now why didn't Jefferson, Madison, and other American presidents of the 19th century, why didn't they simply stretch the Constitution until it included poverty assistance in the form of federal welfare programs? Why does it seem to hardly to have ever even occurred to them? Well, many factors explain this, but this one was most important. Such power was not to be found in the rule book, by which I mean the Constitution. Imagine playing a game, uh, baseball or soccer or a game of cards or whatever. And imagine if there was only one rule, anything goes. In other words, no rules at all. We'll make them up as we go. What kind of a game would this be? It would be chaotic. It would be frustrating unpredictable, impossible. Eventually the whole thing would degenerate into a mad free-for-all. And while simple games would be intolerable if played this way, the consequences for the many deadly serious things that humans engage in from driving on the highways to waging war would be almost too frightful to imagine. The most profound political and philosophical trend of our day is a serious erosion of any wide, widely held view, of any consensus about what government is supposed to do and what it is not supposed to do. But this was not so in Jefferson and Madison's day. The instruction books at that time for them were the American founding documents, namely the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, including its Bill of Rights. In the spirit of those great works, most Americans shared a common view of the sum of good government, namely the protection of life and property. Most Americans felt that if that's all government did, it would have a full-time job on its hands. Today, far too many people think that government exists to, to do anything for anybody at any time they ask for it, from daycare for their children to handouts for artists. Uh, former Texas Congressman Ron Paul was noted for blowing the whistle 
whenever a bill was proposed that violated the spirit of the Constitution. But he quite often did so uh, almost all by himself. How are his appeals, or how would his appeals today be received by the great majority of the members of our Congress? Not very kindly. That's how far we have shifted in thinking in recent decades. I once gave a series of lectures to high school seniors in which I asked the students what they thought the responsibilities of government were. I urge you to try this experiment uh, sometime on almost any audience. I asked them, what do you think the responsibilities of government are? And I heard the most incredible range of opinions from provide jobs to give me this. Uh, right now you have many Americans who say it's the job of government to give us all a free college education. That's what Bernie Sanders is promising. A while back, and now it may sound good, but later you, when you get the bill it doesn't, it doesn't sound quite so good. A while back there was an organization uh, in America called the Communitarian Network. And they made news when they called for the federal government to make organ donations of body parts mandatory. Uh, they wanted every citizen's body after death to be harvested uh, for the benefit of sick people. They wanted to make it uh, a mandatory thing by federal law. Now, like ending poverty, helping sick people is a good cause, but is it really a duty of government to take your kidneys? I don't think Jefferson and Madison would say, yeah, that's in uh, Article 1, Section 2. You can imagine how Jefferson and Madison uh, might have answered such a question. In their day, Americans appreciated the concept of individual rights, and they entertained very little of this nonsense. But there is no consensus today, even on what a right is, let alone uh, which ones free citizens have. Years ago, I recall when the Reagan administration proposed ending subsidies to Amtrak, the passenger rail service in the United States. And I was struck by a woman on television who uh, condemned this proposal, and she phrased her objection this way. I don't know how those people in Washington expect us to get around out here. We have a right to this service. Well, to give you an even stranger example, once when Congress voted to stop funding of the printing of Playboy magazine in Braille, okay, did you, uh, I remember when I first heard this, I didn't even know they were printing Playboy magazine in Braille for blind people at uh, taxpayer expense. The American Council of the Blind filed suit in federal court, charging that the congressional action constituted censorship and the denial of a basic human right. What does that tell you about how rights have now been so confused as to, for people to think that you have a natural basic human right to Playboy magazine in Braille at other people's expense? The lofty notion that individuals possess certain rights, definable, inalienable, and sacred, has been cheapened. It's been cheapened beyond anything that America's founders and early presidents would recognize. When those gifted thinkers asserted rights to freedom of speech, freedom of the press, or freedom of assembly, they did not mean that one has a right to be given a microphone, or given a printing press, or given at taxpayers' expense a lecture hall, or a Playboy magazine at someone else's expense. Indeed, their concept of rights did not require the initiation of force against other people. It did not require the, uh, the uh, elevating of any want to a lawful claim on the life or property of another citizen. Each individual was deemed to be a unique and sovereign being who required only that other citizens deal with him honestly involuntarily or not at all. It was this notion of rights that became an important theme in America's founding documents and early presidencies. It's the only notion of rights that does not produce an unruly mob 
in which each person has his hands in somebody else's pocket. This wisdom prompted early Americans to add a Bill of Rights to a constitution that already contained a separation of government powers, checks and balances, and numerous thou shalt nots directed at government itself. They knew, unlike so many Americans today, that a government that lacks rules and boundaries, that robs Peter to pay Paul to no end, that confuses rights with wants, will yield financial ruin at best and political tyranny at worst. Jefferson, Madison, and almost all of the succeeding 20 presidents of the 19th century were constrained by this view of the federal government, and most of them were happy to comply with it. When doing so, they were faithful to their responsibilities. They were true poverty fighters because they knew that if liberty were not preserved, poverty would be the least of our troubles. They had read the rule books and they knew the importance of following the rules. Andrew Jackson, whose tenure as president stretched from 1829 to 1837, was our seventh president. He too reminded Congress many times in terms that Jefferson would have approved uh, what the proper federal role of government was. In his fourth message to Congress in December of 1832, he said, quote, limited to a general superintending power to maintain peace at home and abroad and to prescribe laws on a few subjects of general interest not calculated to restrict human liberty but to enforce human rights, this government will find its strength and its glory in the faithful discharge of these plain and simple duties. In his second inaugural address, Jackson again underscored the federal government's limited mission. He didn't always faithfully practice it, I admit. He wasn't our best president, but he uh, at, at least on multiple occasions tried his best. He said in his second inaugural, it will be my aim to encourage by my official acts the necessity of exercising by the government those powers only that are clearly assigned or delegated, to encourage simplicity and economy in the expenditures of government, to raise no more money from the people that may be required for these objects, and in a manner that will best promote the interests of all classes of the community and of all portions of the Union. He went on to say, to suppose that because our government has been instituted for the benefit of the people, that it therefore must ha have the power to do whatever may seem to be in the public good, is an error into which even honest minds are too prone to fall. Compared to giants like uh, Jefferson, Madison, and Jackson, Franklin Pierce of New Hampshire is often thought of as uh, forgettable. And in fact, I would, how many have heard of that name, an American president named Franklin Pierce? Not even well known by Americans uh, themselves. But he was another in a long string of 19th century presidents who had their heads on straight when it came to the matter of the federal government's proper role. Among his nine vetoes was one in 1854 that killed a bill to help the mentally ill. Now think about this. Can you imagine a president or a prime minister stopping a bill that would help the mentally ill, that would appropriate government money to help the mentally ill? That would be almost unthinkable today. But he vetoed such a bill, and in these terms he said, it cannot be questioned that if Congress has power to make provision for the insane, it then has the same power to provide for the insane uh, 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 or has the same power to provide uh, to those who are not insane. Sorry. Uh, and can you imagine that? He says, we, if we start down this path and give money, public money, to the insane, before you know it, we'll be giving money to the sane, too. And to, then to transfer to the federal government the charge of all the poor in all the states. 
It has the same power to provide hospitals and other local establishments for the care and cure of every species of human infirmity, and thus to assume all that duty of either public philanthropy or public necessity to the dependent, the orphan, the sick, or the needy, which is now discharged by the states or by corporate institutions or private endowments. The whole field of public benefit is thrown open to the care and culture of the federal government if we travel this path. If Congress may and ought to provide for any one of these objects, it may and ought to provide for them all. So his was a kind of slippery slope argument. If we start uh, spending money for the uh, insane, before you know it, the sane will line up and we'll have everybody on the federal dole. It may be a little laughable at the moment, but how prophetic in other ways uh, his warning was. It's a testament to the lack of federal welfare style programs during more than 60 years under our first 13 presidents that Pierce termed as novel or strange. The very idea of providing for the care and support of all those among the people of the United States uh, who by any form of uh, misfortune become objects of public philanthropy. Meanwhile, at this time, around the world, virtually every other nation on the planet was full of people who were poor because of what governments were doing to them, often in the name of doing something for them, taxing and regulating them into poverty, seizing their property and businesses, persecuting them for their faith, torturing and killing them because they held views different from those in power, and squandering their resources on official luxury, mindless warfare, and brainless boondoggles. America was different in the sense that it was to be about government not doing such things to people. And that one fact alone was by itself a powerfully effective anti-poverty program. Americans of all colors pulled themselves out of poverty in the 19th century, especially after the Civil War, by creating wealth through invention and enterprise. As they did so, they gave generously from their income and their time to the aid of their neighbors and their communities. When the French commentator Alexis de Tocqueville visited a young, bustling America, during the Jackson administration in the 1830s, he cited the vibrancy of this civil society as one of America's greatest assets. De Tocqueville was amazed that Americans were constantly forming what he called associations to advance the arts, to build libraries and hospitals, and to meet social needs of every kind. If something good needed to be done, it didn't occur to people like Andrew Jackson or his fellow citizens to expect politicians and bureaucrats who were distant in both space and spirit to do it for them. De Tocqueville wrote, among the laws that rule human societies, there is one which seems to be more precise and clear than all the others. If men are to remain civilized or to become so, the art of associating together, that is forming private groups to meet uh, social needs, must grow and improve. What's his name? De Tocqueville. Alexis, Alexis Tocqueville. Uh, Tocqueville, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, um, uh, moving along, let me say that uh, uh, personally I think private associations are extraordinarily effective when given the freedom to meet social needs. From start to finish, what private charities do represents a manifestation of free will. No one is compelled to provide assistance. No one is forced to pay for it. No one is required to accept it. All parties come together of their own free will. And that's where the magic of it is. The link between the giver, the provider, and the receiver is strong precisely because each knows that he can walk away from it at the slightest hint of insincerity or broken promises or poor performance. That's not the case with poverty programs of government, which perpetuate themselves irrespective of their outcomes. In the private sector, because each party gives his own time 
and his own resources voluntarily. He tends to focus on the mission. He doesn't get bogged down in secondary agendas like filling out the proper paperwork or encouraging favor from those in power. The late management expert Peter Drucker summed it up well when he said that private charities spend far less for results than governments spend for failure. Now consider a story that I first learned from an old friend of mine, a historian by the name of Burton Folsom. It concerns a fire in 1881 that swept through the state of Michigan's uh, thumb area. If you know Michigan, it looks like a hand, and this area is called the thumb. That fire killed nearly 200 people, and it destroyed about a million acres of timberland. The flames ran faster than a horse could gallop, said one survivor of this devastating blaze. Its hurricane-like fury uprooted trees, blew away buildings, and destroyed millions of dollars in property across four counties. Well, this disaster produced an outpouring of generosity from Americans everywhere. This was in the day before federal disaster relief of any kind. In fact, the Michigan fire became the first disaster relief effort of a woman named Clara Barton and the newly formed American Red Cross. As the smoke billowed eastward across the nation, Barton's homeville, uh, hometown of Dansville, New York, became a focal point of relief. According to the officers of the local Red Cross, a call from Clara Barton rallied us to our work. Instantly, they said, we felt the help and strength of our organization, young and untried as it was. Men, women, and children throughout western New York brought food, clothing, and other gifts. Before the Red Cross would send them to Michigan, a committee of local ladies inspected each item and restitched the garments or replaced food whenever necessary. Speed was important, not only because many were hungry, but also because winter was approaching. Bedding and heavy clothing were in demand. Railroads provided the shipping. People left jobs and homes and trekked to Michigan to get personally involved in the rebuilding effort. Soon the Red Cross in New York and in local relief communities in Michigan were working together to distribute supplies until no more were needed. That's from the final report of the Red Cross. They ended up with more donations for needy people than they ever needed. The Red Cross's assistance was deeply appreciated, and it made disaster relief faster, more efficient, and national in scope. There is little reason to believe, I think, that politicians are ever more compassionate or more caring than the population that elects them. There is little reason to believe that politicians who are not on the scene of either poverty or disaster and don't know the families affected will be more knowledgeable about how best to help them than those who are present and who personally know the victims. There's even less reason to believe that politicians spend other people's money more effectively than those people to whom it belongs in the first place. Instead, when government gets involved, there is good reason to believe that much of its effort simply replaces what private people and groups would probably do better and more cost-effectively if the government stayed home. Now, working towards a conclusion, let me uh, say a few words about my favorite president on these issues, Grover Cleveland. He was our 22nd and our 24th president, the only one to serve two terms that were not uh, consecutive. Cleveland said what he meant and meant what he said. He did not lust for political office. He never, he never felt he had to cut corners or deceive or connive in order to get elected. He was so forthright, so plain spoken, that he makes Harry Truman seem indecisive by comparison. This strong streak of personal character and honesty led Grover Cleveland to the right policy conclusion again and again. H.L. Mencken, uh, the great commentator from the 1920s and 30s, uh, was known for cutting politicians down to size, but he wrote a very nice little essay on Cleveland, and he entitled it, A Good Man 
in a bad trade. Well, Cleveland thought that it was an act of fundamental dishonesty for some to use government for their own benefit at other people's expense. And he meant corporate welfare as well as other forms of welfare too. He took a firm stance against some of the earliest stirrings of an American welfare state. Frequent warnings against the use of government to redistribute income were characteristic of President Cleveland. He regarded as a serious danger the idea that government should dispense favors and advantages uh, to some people or their businesses at other people's expense. This conviction led him to veto 414 bills, more than all the previous 21 presidents combined. In fact, he once said, I ought to have a monument over me when I die, not for anything I have ever done, but for the foolishness I have put a stop to. In 1887, he vetoed a bill called the Texas Seed Bill. It would have appropriated $10,000, equivalent today to about $2 million, uh, $10,000 for aid to drought-stricken farmers in Texas. Farmers hit very hard by a drought. Here's what he said when he killed that bill. I can find no warrant or justification for such an appropriation in the Constitution. And I do not believe that the power and duty of the general government ought to be extended to the relief of individual suffering, which is in no manner related to the public service or public benefit. A prevalent a tendency to disregard the limited mission, the limited duties of this government should be steadfastly resisted to the end that the lesson must constantly be enforced and here's the part I most like, that though the people may support the government, the government should not support the people. Can you imagine a president saying that today? It may be Trump would, but uh, <laughs> not many others. Cleveland went on to point out, quote, the friendliness and charity of our countrymen must always be relied upon to relieve their fellow citizens in misfortune. Well, Americans proved him right. Those Texas farmers eventually received, in private assistance, not government assistance, more than 10 times what the bill would have provided that Cleveland vetoed. There was one newspaper in Kentucky, the Louisville Courier Journal, who supported the president's veto and they said, we will prove him right. We will raise at least $10,000 from our own constituents and get it to Texas. And they did. Cleveland was uh, a devoted Christian, and this played a role in his thinking. The notion of taking from some and giving to others, he thought, was a violation of the Eighth and Tenth Commandments. Those commandments warn us against theft and envy. He noticed what 20th century welfare statists did not, and namely that is that there is a period after the word steal in the Eighth Commandment with no added qualifications. It does not say, thou shalt not steal unless the other man has more than you do, <laughs> or thou shalt not steal unless you can find a politician to do it for you. Or thou shalt not steal unless you're absolutely sure you can spend it better than the, man who, than the man who earned it. Cleveland was faithful to the ideas of the founders and to what he believed were uh, God's commandments. Also to common sense and historical experience. For the first 150 years of American history, government at all levels played very little role in what we now call social welfare very little compared to what it has in recent decades. And now we know that after five and a half trillion dollars in a series of catastrophic fiscal and social consequences since the great society of Lyndon Johnson was begun, those old-fashioned virtues and principles of our early presidents were right on the mark. More than a hundred years ago, the great intellectual and crusader for liberty 
Auburn Herbert, member of the British Parliament, offered this very keen observation. He said, no amount of state education will make a really intelligent nation. No amount of poor laws will place a nation above want. No amount of factory acts will make us better parents. To have our wants supplied from without by a huge state bureaucracy, to be regulated and inspected by great armies of public officials who are themselves slaves of the system they administer, will in the long run teach us nothing and profit us nothing. In March of 2005, an international commission called upon wealthy countries, and you've heard many such declarations in the years since, it called upon wealthy countries like the United States to dramatically increase its foreign aid. And many of the governments of Europe are in full support. But what would American presidents of the 19th century have had to say about that? I can imagine Cleveland, Pierce, Jackson, Van Buren, Madison, Jefferson, reacting in disbelief at the very suggestion, aid to foreign countries? We don't even dispense aid to our fellow Americans. I can see them saying that. And he would have had a century of unprecedented progress against poverty to point to as a great example. For the benefit of uh, those who are captivated by the welfare state, I think Cleveland and the others I've spoken of today would be very comfortable, very comfortable in echoing these sentiments from the 19th century French economist and statesman Frederick Bastiat. And I close with the way he ended his great book, The Law, in 1850. Quote, and now that the legislators and the do-gooders have so futilely inflicted so many systems upon society, May they finally end where they should have begun. May they reject all systems and try liberty. For liberty is an acknowledgement of faith in God and his works. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for listening. I appreciate it and would be happy to take some questions. Bardzo dziękujemy za fantastyczny wykład i teraz taka informacja techniczna. Otóż jeżeli ktoś będzie chciał zadać pytanie, proszę podnieść rękę. Piotr wręczy mikrofon. Pytania można za zadawać zarówno po angielsku, jak i po polsku. Odpowiedzi oczywiście będą po angielsku. Um, okay, hello, I'm Maciej Bittner, Wise Europe. Um, I would like to, to ask you to, to, to comment on the proposal made by Charles Murray that uh, he was serious, but some people consider it as a provocation, by, um, of um, abolishing all the welfare programs and mm -hmm. substituting it with uh, a basic income. Yes. What do you think about that? Yes, I, as a matter of fact, uh, Maciej, I happen to have been on a panel with him where this came up about two years ago, and we had a, an occasion to talk briefly about it. Charles Murray is, has proposed uh, that in place of all welfare programs that there be a single check from the federal government uh, to every American at the age of, I think, 20 or 21 in the amount of $20,000 and just tell everybody, he says, okay, that's it. One time, you all get a check, $20,000, and that's all you get. Make the most of it. And I was stunned that he made such a suggestion because one of the lessons of welfare programs is that once you concede the uh, responsibility of government to take from some and give to others, uh, that it's almost impossible to draw the line. And so even if in the short run, replacing all of our current programs with, with a single check at, age of, at the age of 20, even if in the short run that, that helped uh, with the budget, it would not stay at 20,000. 
because you ultimately are conceding that this is a proper function of government. And what you would have if, uh, very quickly is politicians competing with each other to raise the amount. The next election, you'd have politicians saying, don't vote for that guy because he only wants to give you 22,000. But if you vote for me, I'll give you 26. Uh, and so in no time at all, I think th this policy would be completely unsustainable and you'd be back to where we are today. Uh, I much prefer a, uh, an approach that says, look, this is not government's responsibility in the first place. And there are so many things that government in the United States, maybe here too, uh, is doing that keep people in poverty. Let's get rid of those barriers before we start adding new barriers and new problems in the form of things like a single check for your life for a lifetime. Um, so I don't think it's an answer. I, I think my guess is Charles Murray was proposing it thinking, well, we're never going to get rid of all federal welfare, so let's just put in place something that might work better. But I don't think it's sustainable. I think politicians would outbid each other. Uh, to make it more generous. Uh, welcome to you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I have heard uh, with very great pleasure your uh, review of American uh, presidents. Thank you. Uh, so I'm according uh, my question uh, to this quantity. To what? To this quantity of presidents uh, in America. Ah, yes. Mm -hmm. So I have chosen few one. Mm -hmm. So, but uh, I have a few uh, questions. Okay. For instance, one or two or three. It depends uh, on you. Okay. So, the first question, which I would like to put to you, is uh, counter sense of the main topic of the, today's meeting. Because you have written uh, such a sentence that American president, this is the poverty. Mm -hmm. And the second part of your uh, presentation is uh, that uh, clever 19th uh, century are the best. So what, is, <laughs> what does it mean, the first part, and this is according to the second part? Because the first part of your uh, uh, presentation is the president and uh, uh, bad e economy. Bad economy. Mm. Poverty. Poverty. And the next uh, next part of president uh, in your relation, whether shown as a good uh, president in the United States. The second second one. Uh, if it is not, not a problem for you, sir, I would like you to choose one question, which is... Tylko jedno pytanie. And the other one question, so in accordance to the main topic of your presentation. So we have uh, here in Poland such a saying uh, in accordance to, to your presentation. So it was uh, and is not present. Mm -hmm. uh, we, do not, we do not write in, the, in our register. Uh, do you agree with, it, with me? Uh, Peter, are you able to... I, I'm not certain I understand the question. To ja może jeszcze poproszę jakąś kolejną osobę i tutaj nad tym pytaniem się zastanowimy i później postaramy się na nie odpowiedzieć po prostu zbiorczo, jeżeli pan nie ma nic przeciwko. OK. A. Idziemy po tak uh, Mr. Professor, uh, my name is Sebastian Roy, uh, and uh, my question is as following. Um, well, I can imagine that uh, in the United States um, all these governmental programs uh, may be well uh, replaced by the private charity, and it is due to the fact that in America uh, this society is like very active. There, there are so many organizations, communities, and people interact. But, uh, well, when it comes to Europe, um, problems begin. And what is your opinion? Do you think that uh, in a foreseeable future, uh, European societies uh, may become efficient enough to form these private charities and different forms of organization to replace the governmental programs? Ah, Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, good question. I, I realize, of course, that I was uh, speaking entirely in the American context, and there are very different cultural issues 
that may make uh, a reemergence of of uh, private charity to replace the welfare state difficult in, in many places, if not impossible. Uh, what I hope is that people everywhere might come to uh, some universal uh, truths. Uh, and I don't think there's any people in any country that are immune uh, from these truths. And they include such things uh, that I mentioned, such as the government doesn't have anything to give anybody except what it first takes from somebody. So we should not assume from the start that if government uh, relieves poverty or relieves social needs of some kind, that somehow this is coming from the tooth fairy that otherwise would not be available for, for private people to ap apply. Uh, I think that's one of the truths. And another truth is that ultimately what all of us should want is a society where people do the right thing such as helping those in need, not because they have to, not because there's a gun at their head, uh, but because they want to. Wouldn't that be the most, uh, 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 the kind of society you would most want to live in? Where nobody says, uh, that person is in need, don't ask me to help, I think the government should do it. Can you, you, know, you all know the story of the, great, of the uh, Good Samaritan, right, uh, from the Bible. What, why is the Good Samaritan known to this day as good? Because he came upon a man in great need. And he did not say to that man, sorry, not my responsibility, sorry, call your social worker, or write a letter to the emperor, or oh, you, you obviously need help from some government program. No, he actually pitched in, helped himself, uh, the man himself with his own money. If he had not done that, if he had walked away and said, that's government's responsibility, today we would not know of him as the good Samaritan. We would know of him as the good-for-nothing Samaritan. So uh, in one sense, I, I may be painting an ideal, maybe even an impossible one, in, uh, at least for the moment. It may seem impossible to not have government in the business of taking care of the needy. But what is the ideal? It isn't redistribution. It isn't caring for the needy because we have to. The ideal is because we want to. And we're never going to get there if we don't begin teaching it, preaching it, and practicing it today. So I'm perfectly comfortable in painting a scenario that may seem impossible. But seeming impossible at the moment doesn't mean it's not the best route uh, or best objective to, to strive for. Uh, I, I, don't, I think we can, as a compassionate people, do so much better than expecting government to meet these needs instead of meeting them ourselves uh, with the same resources that government has. It takes it from us, but we can solve these problems so much better, so much more effectively. So I, I know it may be a, a bigger stretch in many countries to get to that point than it is, say, even in America today. But I see it as an ideal nonetheless. I want a society where people do the right thing because they want to, not because they have to. Okay. My name is Christopher Moszyński, and uh, first I want to thank you for a very interesting lecture. Thank you. Uh, and uh, my question is, what pieces of advice do you have uh, for the young friends of liberty in Poland yes. uh, to better uh, educate ourselves on the uh, matters of, of the uh, practical application of the principle and uh, how can we more effectively uh, lobby the government mm. uh, in the direction of liberty? Okay, thank you. That's a terrific uh, question. Uh, would you mind if just for a moment if I digress uh, well, not at all. And then I'll get right to your question. I want to address that uh, directly. But it just occurred to me, uh, uh, I want to tell you about one person who knew, personally knew, more American presidents than any other man or woman, living or dead. You know, we've had, uh, Mr. Obama's number 44. We've had 43 people serve as president. Uh, Grover Cleveland counts twice. Uh, so 43 people who have served as president, but there's one person, and it was a woman, who came to know more presidents of the United States, either when they were in office or in some cases later, 
than any other American, living or dead. And you wouldn't, I wouldn't expect you to know her name, but anybody would you like to guess how many presidents did this woman personally meet and know out of 43? 230 years of American history. No, no. This woman was named Fanny Crosby, and she knew 21 American presidents. Almost half of all the men who ever served as president. Uh, she met every president from John Quincy Adams through and including Woodrow Wilson. Now keep in mind, John Quincy Adams was elected president in 1824. Woodrow Wilson was elected in 1912. 21 presidents in that span of time. She met Adams uh, long after he left the White House. Uh, after, as a former president, he then ran for Congress and served for 17 years in the House of Representatives. And it was during that time that Fanny Crosby met him. 21 presidents that this one woman met. She died 101 years ago in 1915. Now, to your question, what should young uh, people, what's the message to young people if they want to advance liberty uh, in society? I think there's the, the most important thing, if you want to be a person of influence, especially uh, on behalf of good ideas like liberty, if you want to reform the world, it starts with yourself. So many people are active in wanting to reform the world and they ignore their own lives. And in many cases, they're busy reforming the world even as their own lives fall into disrepair and dysfunction. I think the number one issue of all time is personal character. So um, let, me, let me put it a, a number of ways. By character, I mean things like uh, honesty, I mean speaking your word and keeping it. I mean intellectual humility. By that I mean recognizing that as much as you may know, there is still a universe of knowledge out there that you don't know. Have you ever noticed that in the halls of government, Washington DC especially, they're full of people who are not humble, right? who think that they know how to run your life for you. Uh, there's a great essay. In fact, it's in a book that we're going to give everybody a book tonight, right? Yes. Oh, good. Uh, please don't leave tonight without a book that I brought for each of you. It's free. Uh, there's a little essay in it called I Pencil. Ah. And it's classic. It goes back to, uh, to 1958, our founder at Fee. And he tells the story as if he were a pencil, explaining how he came into being. And the pencil explains, well, my eraser comes from substance from a tree in Malaysia. My, the core of the pencil uh, uh, comes from, it's graphite, comes from the ground. And he explains that for anybody to make a pencil, uh, you have to bring together endless skills and knowledge from lots of different people. No one person in the world knows how from start to finish to make a pencil himself. That's a remarkable thing. You think of a pencil as so simple. And yet, if somebody told you, go out and make one without relying upon the contributions of anybody else in knowledge, resources, skills, talents, whatever, from, from the ground up, you could not make a pencil. What does that say about your ability to plan the lives of 40 million other people? Not possible. So intellectual humility is an important part of character. Responsibility. Uh, not trying to say when you make a mistake or make an error or misjudgment, the rest of the world owes me a living. Give me a bailout. You owe me. It's your fault. Societies are full of such people who, who flee from their responsibility and want to uh, put them on to other people. Um, I don't think a free society can be sustained if, if people think that widely. Also, self-reliance to the extent that your physical abilities and your mental abilities permit it. That's important. How can you help other people if you haven't taken care first of yourself and your family? Uh, so all the traits, uh, traits of strong character, I think, are something that each of us ought to work on the moment we come to understand how important character is. Believe me, if you emphasize your own self-reform, self-improvement, 
Doors will open. You'll be a person of influence. Others will seek you out. When you speak, they will listen. So if you want to advance liberty, start by uh, being the very best that you can be in all that you undertake. Because then you'll be in a position to influence others. You'll be in a position to help others when they need help. So that may be a roundabout way of answering your question. I mean, there are endless other ways to approach it. You know, what do you do in your life to apply that? That depends on things like your talents, your abilities, the circumstances that you face, where you can best apply yourself. Only you can make that decision. But you're going to be far better equipped to solve problems, to change your country, and to um, uh, influence others if you have become uh, the best a person of the most solid character yourself from the very, very beginning. Uh, I'll, I'll end my answer with this famous quote. It comes from uh, the Apostle Paul. And uh, it's one that I think, whether you're a Christian or not, it's, it's words of wisdom that all of us should emulate. It was the night before he was uh, martyred. And he wrote... I have fought the fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. What did he mean by that? I think he meant, you know, I, I wasn't perfect. There was a time, in fact, if he would reflect on his life, he would have had to admit there was a time when I was downright evil. But once I understood what I came to regard as, as right, the right course for my life, I never stopped in applying it as best I could in every circumstance. And here 2,000 years later, he's a man of enormous influence. So it starts with your character. Character and liberty are two sides of the same coin. And that's the point, by the way, of the, of the book that we want to give you tonight. It's, it makes that very point in more detail than, than I have time tonight. So I urge you to, to read it. Thank you very much for your answer, and I hope that your words uh, will become an inspiration for me, as well as for other people who will uh, hear them. Thank you. There are so many Poles in your history who are exemplars, or examples of great character. Uh, people like Father Papayushko, whose church we visited today, and people like Maria Sklodowska, or Marie Curie, and... Uh, um, so, you have many wonderful examples in Polish history to look to. Hello, Professor. Here. Ah, yes. Hi. Uh, my name is Bartek. Welcome to Warsaw again. Thanks Thank for you. coming. Uh, I have two questions. First, uh, what is the biggest disadvantage of a monarchy towards achieving the, the goals of liberty? And the second, um, what do you think about the uh, immigration crisis? Europe today. What's, ah. what's your analysis or reflection? Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. What are the biggest disadvantages of, of monarchy? Uh, I was once asked uh, a similar question with regard to democracy. Uh, so let me answer it in, in that context and I'll bring it all together. I know uh, democracy is often uh, elevated to uh, a quite, a, quite a lofty ideal. But I've always felt that uh, democracy uh, is no guarantee of liberty or of sound policy. I mean, the, the very broad concept of, of uh, the great majority of people being able to determine who, who serves in government, what their policies are, that's certainly better than any dictatorship. But people can vote themselves into slavery. People can vote themselves uh, into fiscal insolvency and vote themselves into disaster. It's no guarantee. Uh, there are other things that are more important than simply the right to vote, and that is, includes things like personal character, the kinds of policies we embrace and the kind that we reject. Uh, but the one saving grace of democracy is that it allows for change without violence. At least if we know that if we're unhappy with what the government is doing today, we'll have an opportunity at some point to, to, to change it. it. It allows for change without violence. Now to bring this back to your question uh, about monarchy, I think the biggest disadvantage of monarchy is 
that it, it usually does not permit change. Uh, it, you, the people can be moving in one direction, but the monarch may be stuck in the direction that he or she has, has held for, for decades. And there's no real way to change it because you can't vote him out of office. So uh, when monarchy stops uh, behaving in a way of the people, there's no peaceful way to change uh, if that monarch will not change. Whereas democracy, at least you can go to the polls and, and try to make a change. Um, so that, that, I think, is the biggest disadvantage of it. And then you asked me about uh, the immigration crisis. I know that uh, from a European perspective, it's, it's, it's a somewhat different issue than it is in America. It may be more complicated here by the presence of a uh, uh, of welfare states. Uh, uh, that The welfare state complicates so many issues. My view is that anybody, uh, in our country anyway, I, uh, you can decide if, it's, uh, if this applies to Poland, but I would love to have a situation where anybody from anywhere can come to America anytime they want to, if they want to work, and if they want to uh, be enterprising, if they stake no claim on other people. That's a win-win for everybody. They come, they produce, they trade, they, they add to the wealth of society, they add to the cultural enrichment. But welfare states complicate that because when they come, they put immediate pressures upon people involuntarily. That's a tough problem to solve. For me to say, yes, there should be unlimited immigration to Europe is at the same time I'm saying there should be unlimited claims upon fellow citizens through the welfare state. And I can't bring myself to say that. So, uh, uh, but generally speaking, I'm a free immigration person. I, I, I think people should be free to come, but they should uh, be sponsored locally or provide for themselves. Uh, through private institutions, not through uh, government programs. Do you know what country in, in, uh, over near us that does that very well? Canada. Canada is welcoming hundreds of thousands of Syrian refugees and it's not an issue. You know why? Because there is no government program uh, for the settlement of, um, of um, refugees. They all have to be sponsored by private agencies. So you have private people saying, yes, we'll take care of this one. We'll take care of that one. You have churches and private organizations. So in Canada, they don't have the kind of crisis that our politicians in America are complaining about. Uh, because in America, it's illegal now for private agencies to sponsor an immigrant family. How ridiculous. It, uh, so uh, I, I don't know if I've really answered it. I know it's a tough question, but I hope I've helped. I just want to know your opinion. Yeah. That's enough. Thank you very much. Yeah, in free societies, people aren't the problem. They're only a problem in welfare states. So first and foremost, I would like to stand up because I don't like sitting and asking questions. And I would like to greet you, Professor, as I am, I am this young, strange person that, that asked you to bring a book and sign it also. Tom. Co yeah, Tom. <laughs> exactly this one book. But my question isn't about it because, yes, I know it, Be because I, I read a few articles written by you about Poland. Yeah. And my question is about the Solidarność movement mm -hmm. because I think that you are too optimistic about this movement mm -hmm. and I'm just not saying it as a young person because mm -hmm. I wrote you on Facebook yes. that this is the perspective I would like to touch if I yes. can say so because I'm not just a, per a young person who thinks about emigrations I think many people there also yeah. but the thing is that that due to my self-reliance and many other principles, I got a job offer from the United States mm -hmm. voluntarily, and the thing is that this, this job offer and they said that I can even come on a tourist visa there and they will support me mm. and, and the, help the, me with... The, comp the company will. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. and, and the, but the thing is that they want even to support me because they prefer me over all those free shit losers. That support Bernie Sanders, and <laughs> and yeah, and my my this is the perspective I'm asking mm -hmm. from, and the question was exactly whether I am right about your opinion on the movement of Solidarność. Ah. 
uh, I'm the first to admit that my knowledge of solidarity is sort of from afar. And so uh, there may be lots of issues and problems that I'm, I'm not aware of. But I can tell you how I saw solidarity in the 1980s from, from a 35,000 foot level. Uh, having for decades seen uh, communism wreak such damage, such uh, spiritual and economic damage upon uh, Eastern Europe, I saw the rise of solidarity with all of its Whatever its flaws and warts were, I know that the, the, much of the platform looks looked like a social welfare state platform, but, but I saw solidarity in, in terms of a bigger picture. It was an independent movement, uh, or at least many, most people in it felt independent, that they could do something without uh, government p p uh, permission or government planning or government direction, government mandates. That's so critical to a free society. So I remember thinking, hey, I don't know the personalities in solidarity. They may have many motives, many uh, conflicting temperaments, whatever. But at least the idea of an independent organization challenging the communist regime, I thought, was hero heroic. And uh, that kind of activity was critically necessary. And it wasn't just from solidarity. There was uh, many other groups that some of you probably know about, freedom and peace. I recall was very active, um, but also banned during martial law. Uh, organizations that rose up privately, voluntarily, spontaneously to demand things like free elections and uh, much less government control over society. I, I welcomed that, even if they, there were flaws and problems of, of personality. So you may be right, uh, uh, Tomas, that there were plenty of flawed people in it, but that's how I saw it, is from 10,000 miles away. Perhaps I, I might add as a solidarity, well, veteran in a way, uh, that I fully support, uh, Professor. Solidarity was about Volmost. Solidarity was about freedom, uh, basically. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Professor, uh, for coming here and mm -hmm. mentioning Canada, my second country. Of course, uh, Canada does, does well with uh, immigrants, yes. and we build our society based on them. But my question is not related to Canada, but related to some ideas that you mentioned, uh, especially with the Madison. And uh, as uh, he was the founder of uh, uh, the Constitution, Madison Hamilton J., yes. Life, Liberty, and Pursuit of the Happiness, mm -hmm. uh, no one has to be uh, really uh, here convinced of the free market that is higher uh, over uh, the central plant economy. Uh, especially in that uh, school uh, such as uh, this one. But as we go in smaller villages in Poland, what advice would you give teachers, not only economics teachers, uh. but social science teachers? How should they approach and, and help uh, the students, not mm -hmm. only in the big universities, but also in the smaller schools, to, uh, for example, uh, that uh, people are much more aware yes. that they are doing themselves more harm by yes. voting into the poverty, yeah, yeah. by corrupting the government actually yeah. and the government is getting more corrupt yeah. by that way so thank you oh, uh, another good question uh, I suppose there are several ways to answer this but I'm, I'm going to give you one big uh, central point here this is I think one of the biggest failures of American education today it may be true in Poland as well I don't know my guess is a, a lot of similarities there was a time in America when I think Americans, because of the education they received, did understand that there was a fundamental difference between government and everything else. They understood that government is the only entity in society that can legally employ force. It was not like the Girl Scouts. It was not like the Red Cross, you know, which has to ask you for contributions. It could take your money. And that was one of many reasons why I think Americans early in our history wanted to keep it small, because they thought in terms of the use of force against your fellow man is fundamentally immoral. It should be limited. It should be limited to retaliating against someone's use of force against you. But you don't run around using force just because you think it's a good thing to do or you have a good good idea as to how to spend the money once you've taken it. 
Uh, but today, uh, is it true in Poland as it is in the United States that uh, young people are, are not being raised in, or taught that there is this difference? That government is just like anything else, so why shouldn't we have it do anything? Uh, that there isn't that bright line between the initiation of force and the use of retaliatory force. People don't understand that government, by its very definition, is force. There's a, there's a great uh, uh, quote that's been attributed to George Washington, although it's never been verified. So I hesitate to say it was from him, but it certainly sums up the view of most of America's founders, and that is this. Government is not reason, it's not eloquence, it's not persuasion, Government is force. And like fire, it can be either a dangerous servant or a fearful master. Now think about that. That's, I, I, what I'm trying to do is to illustrate how I, if I could influence every Polish teacher, I would say teach young people the distinction here so they can make an informed choice. Do they want society organized around the political use of force? to get things done anytime somebody says, let's do this? Or do they want a society where we minimize the use of force and we respect each other's rights to life and property? Uh, but if they don't teach that, then we all grow up thinking, oh, well, government's just like the Girl Scouts. Why shouldn't it do anything that anybody wants it to do? But there's a fundamental critical difference. And I don't know how people can make a, uh, a reasoned conclusion about what government should do and what it shouldn't do if they don't grasp that essential point. It's different from every other institution for that one reason alone, more powerful than all the others, and that is that it rests upon the legal use of force. So we all must ask ourselves as adults, how much of that do we want? Do we want a society in which things get done routinely by the use of force? Or do we want a society where we to the greatest extent possible, we respect the lives, the decisions, the property, the contracts, the associations, the choices of other people. That's what the question is. If you, you know, how big should government get is the same way as asking how much initiation of force do you want in society? And I go back to what I said earlier. I want a society where people do the right thing because they want to, not because there's a gun at their head. So that's what I would tell Polish teachers. Unfortunately, you have time for the last question. So uh, Professor Reed, my name is Big Yanik. First, uh, a, uh, a side remark on democracy. Uh, I, th I think that democracy doesn't always ensure peaceful transformation. Adolf Hitler was also elected democratically. That's right. It even has uh, shortcomings in that regard. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. So what my question regards uh, uh, the U.S., National debt, I think, mm -hmm. at the moment is about uh, $19 trillion. Yes. So uh, do you think this problem is solvable or the whole thing will go down? Yeah. W one thing is clear to me. I don't believe that the $19 trillion national debt will ever be paid off in dollars of the same value in which it was contracted. <laughs> I don't see the, uh, the United States government ever coming to the point where it says, well, we, we owe you $1,000 for that bond you bought, but now we're not going to give it to you. No, they'll give it to you, but it may be worth a lot less uh, because that debt now is so sizable, I don't see how it can be paid off without erosion in the value of the currency. I don't want to sound too pessimistic, though, because it is, there is no debt instrument like a bond or a note or a bill. There's no debt instrument that the U.S. government has issued that is still outstanding, that must be paid, that has a duration longer than 30 years. In fact, the average is much less than that. If we could somehow balance our federal budget today, now that's another big question. You know, we'd have to cut spending this year by $500 billion to balance it. But if we could balance it today and keep it balanced every year, so we didn't add another dollar to the debt, in less than 30 years it would be completely paid off. But the problem is we... Oh yeah, but then they'd spend a fortune and they'd uh, go even deeper into debt. Yeah, yeah. so, uh, so I, I still am hopeful that it, 
that we can stop it at some point, but no nation has ever traveled this path uh, without either uh, deciding uh, we're, we're going to balance our budget and curtail spending, stop demanding more of government. I'd be hard-pressed to give an example of that. Most nations go the other way. They just keep adding to it. Look at the presidential candidates in America right now. None of them, uh, well, maybe, with maybe one or two possible exceptions, but even they, not, not as specific as they should, none of them are really addressing this in any specific way. None of them are saying, here's my list of budget cuts uh, so as to bring this budget into balance. So they just talk in general terms. Mr. Trump, uh, he actually says he will not do anything to change entitlement spending. And yet that's the single biggest source of the growing debt. So he, he's admitting up front, like Obama, I'm not even going to try to solve it. Uh, he attacks it, says it's a problem, he doesn't like it, but he also says he's not going to do anything to, to stop the major reason for its growth. Uh, this goes back to what I said earlier about the importance of character. How does a nation find itself $19 trillion in debt except through an erosion of character? I mean, this is we tell uh, our audiences of young people, it's... It's, it's bad economics to have debt this massive, but even more important, it's a terrible commentary on the uh, moral character of those who have voted to give us this debt. What they're saying is, we want lots of things now, but we don't want to pay for it. We want to send the bill to you kids. We want you to pay for it long after we're gone. We want the goodies, and we're going to send you the bill. I don't know how people sleep at night with that. So uh, that's why I think things like the national debt are a reflection of something much more fundamental, and that is an erosion in character. There was a time in American history that the idea of having massive programs that we can't afford and send the bill to our grandkids, that would have, people would have been horrified by that. They would have said, what? People of solid character don't do that. The bad people do that, not good people. But here we do it today, and we can you know, the Democratic Party, Mr. Sanders, won an election last night in the state of Michigan. And what's, what's his biggest promise? Free college education. You know, $19 trillion in debt? Oh, forget that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to add trillions more. That's, it's, it's stupidity. And it's also it's a, it's a sign of a decline in moral character. It's just fundamentally immoral to make promises you can't keep unless you steal from generations not yet born. That is fundamentally immoral. Thank you. Well, well, I will also ask you maybe one last question. Uh, well, I, I am inspired in many points by uh, institu institutional economics, and I know you are yes. more uh, Austrian-oriented economists, and by Michael Novak. Yes. And in which points do you agree with them? In which points do you disagree? Very briefly. With Austrians? Yeah, Austrians and Michael Novak. Oh, okay. Well, um, I, am, I consider myself a, an economist of the Austrian school. Uh, now, that's not to say that Austrians don't have disagreements amongst each other. Mises had different disagreements with Hayek. Uh, but by and large, uh, uh, there were many principles that, that, that brought them all together. So if you're asking uh, what differences might I have with Austrian economists, I am one, so I'm hard to, it'd be hard for me to, I can't think of any. That, uh, yeah. See, uh, the, the Austrian school has always appealed to me since, since my high school days because um, it grasps uh, the, a fundamental principle of uh, intellectual humility. That's why Austrians don't play around with uh, too many charts and graphs and uh, equations, because we think it's, that's, those are attempts to sort of uh, distill human action into mathematics. It, uh, it's like, uh, here's an example I used to use in my classes. Imagine a dog who is running across a field towards a fence. And as he gets close to the fence, of course, he leaps over the fence. And if you were to take a picture at the point where he's at the peak of his jump, as he's jumping over the fence, and you looked at it later, you might, would, would you look at that and say, hmm, dogs live on top of fences? 
No, all you've got is one fleeting moment in time. So that's why Austrians, for instance, were, when we draw a supply and demand graph, we say, okay, we'll, we'll draw it for you, but keep in mind this is a very imperfect way to describe one fleeting moment in time that you really should be focused on, in the case of the dog, where did he come from? Why was he running across that field and not another? Why did he choose to jump across the fence at that point? Where's he going to go once he hits the other side? You know, those questions are not answered by a graph that, that at most depicts the dog at one fleeting moment of his journey. Um, there's a lot more to it than, than just that, but I, I find myself uh, thinking that Austrian economics does a better job of, of explaining reality than any other school of thought. Um, Differences with Michael Novak. Uh, I have great respect for him. In fact, one of the illegal books uh, that I brought out of Poland in 1986, uh, it's Ill, Ill, uh, illegally translated and published uh, by the underground, is Michael Novak's The Spirit of Democratic Capitalism. Uh, I cherish that copy. I honestly could not tell you where I might disagree. Uh, I like the fact that as a theologian also, he puts an emphasis on moral uh, uh, character as well. So I would find myself in great agreement. Any differences I might have would, I think, be pretty minor. By the way, I have, you know what my most prized possession uh, is that I have at home? I've written about this many times. I've posted pictures of it on my Facebook page. It's from Poland. When I was here in 1986, one evening, uh, my escorts, my Polish escorts who were taking me around, putting me up at a different home every night, uh, to stay a step ahead of the government. Uh, these were all people who were active in the anti-regime uh, resistance. One night there was a nest of underground printers that my hosts wanted me to meet. They said, oh, these guys are printing, mostly young people, printing uh, books, translating them from uh, English and other languages into Polish, printing them illegally, distributing them, great works on freedom that were officially banned. Before I left that evening, Oh, I should tell you, uh, I said, I asked the, the young people who were showing me all this, these stacks of illegal literature, I said, where do you guys get all the paper to print this stuff? Since the government owns all the printing presses, where do you get the paper? And a young man named Pavel answered this way. He said, we get the paper from two places. One, we smuggle it in from the West. And two, we steal it from communists. And I said, what do you mean by that? He said, well, the, the government has its factories. They, they make their publications. But increasingly, the workers there think like we do. And they smuggle the government's paper out and sometimes even print our stuff on the government's own printing presses. I was so impressed. And then, uh, uh, oh, but the, uh, I asked before I left, I said, Is, how can I help you guys? What can I do to help you? And they already had a, a plan in mind. They were going to raise whether I asked the question or not. They said, we would like you to find $5,000, get it to our uh, network in Paris. They know how to get it to us. Because what we want to do is to publish Milton Friedman's Free to Choose. We want to translate it into English and publish it illegally and distribute it in Poland. Can you get $5,000? I went to a friend in New Orleans he was such a strong anti-communist. All you had to do was to say, hey, somebody over here doesn't like communists. He'd say, I'll write, I'll write him a check. You know? <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and he got the $5,000 to me. I got it to the friends in Paris. And in 1989, I got my copy of Free to Choose inscribed by one of uh, a leading Polish dissident thanking me for, for finding that money and making that possible. That's my most prized possession. And it's indicative of why I love Poland and the Polish people. Because historically, you have stood so often on the ramparts of freedom against oppression from within and oppression from without. Even at times when you had no country, you weren't on the map and you fought back. And there is a Poland today because of that. That to me is uh, inspiration for all time. So thank you for everything. <laughs>
the name of of uh, of myself and uh, our students, uh, also from from our association, I would like to thank you for your for your very interesting and very inspiring uh, reflection. Uh, I think I hope it will be also inspiration for our next meetings with well, sometimes very different people, but. Uh, <laughs> D different opinions is uh, is something very important to to create our own uh, well, wisdom maybe too much but yes wisdom thank okay. you very thank much. you very much professor my pleasure thank, thank you. you thank you thank you thank you thank you so thank you very much and I hope you will come next time to inspire young people like them thank you very much anytime. Proszę Państwa, czy czasu zostało nam bardzo niewiele? Czy znaczy Panu Profesorowi, bo my to mamy dużo. Książkę Pana Profesora można otrzymać wychodząc. Pani Kasia będzie te książki rozdawać. No mamy jeszcze jakieś 10 minut, więc jeżeli ktoś by chciał podejść do Pana Profesora, zrobić sobie zdjęcie, zdobyć podpis na książce, to w ciągu tych 10 minut, no maksimum 15 musimy się wyrobić, niestety. Oh, oh, that's right. Okay. Is Stefan here? Is Stefan here? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, fine. 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 Yeah